Yes, thanks for coming. Nobody knew what time it was going to be. I didn't even know. Okay, thank you. I'm glad you guys hung in there and made it. Ah, anyway, okay, well. So take us back 30 years, Cassandra. <laughs> Holy cow, where did, where did the time go? can't even remember what I did in the last 30 minutes. <laughs> we'll see what we did in 30 years, okay. Um, now, I was thinking about running a little clip from the Blu-ray, which you might want to tell sure, me about. Sure, yeah. yeah we, uh, I've, I've announced before that the movie's finally coming out on Blu-ray. You know, special edition, all the bells and whistles. You know, all the fancy stuff they do with these movies. Uh, it's, it's never looked better. Uh, there'll be commentaries on the disc with the original director, Jim Signorelli. Cassandra has a commentary. It's just tons of extras. Three different documentaries, um, including one that's almost as long as the movie, which this was the trailer for. So, uh, yeah, you want to check it out. It doesn't have a release date yet. It's been postponed a few times. It was a different distributor, but now it's in the right hands and it's finally coming out. We could actually show you a clip of one of the uh, great interviews that was conducted by myself and Jim Coons. Uh, so we're going to show you a clip from the documentary To Macabre. <laughs> so anyway, let's talk. Let's uh, <laughs> take us back 30 years. Originally, you develop, you were developing the Elvira character to be uh, a TV, have her own TV show. Besides your syndicated movie hosting show, you wanted to have a tel Elvira TV series that sort of morphed into the first movie. Could you give us the background on that? Uh, yeah, I don't know if a clip will come up sort of talking about that, but um, initially, uh, NBC approached me when I was hosting horror movies locally, and NBC, uh, the president, Brandon Tartikoff, at that time approached me and wanted me to do a TV series on NBC. And I had this uh, crazy idea. I don't, now I can kick myself in the butt a hundred times, like, why did I do that? But he, he, I said I wanted to do a movie, not a TV series. Because back in those days, you literally, if you did TV first, you were never going to be in the movies, ever. Now people go back and forth, you know? They can do a movie, then they can do TV, and, you know, on and on. But um, back then, if you did a movie, you were, oh, somebody's sneaking up there. <laughs> we're good, we're good. All right, we're going to start oh, this. Oh, we're ready, okay. Yeah. I didn't finish yeah. the story, but anyway, <laughs> I insisted that I do a movie, and uh, that's what we did. Believe it or not, NBC said, okay, we don't do movies, but we'll fund this movie. And, um... There was the problem. But anyway, no. Uh, anyway, so that, that's the end of that. Okay, here's the interview. All right. Eric Fuller, I love him. He's been in a thousand movies since then. Um, I think Elvira was his first movie, a major uh, part in a movie. And it was so funny, he was a real estate salesman at the time. And in our movie, he played a real estate salesman. So, typecasting. Um, anyway, yeah, that was Kurt. And it is true, I talk about this a lot in the book that I'm writing, that may, I may be writing for the next 40 years, I don't know. But uh, that, that back then, in the early 80s, it was really weird. If you, I mean, and, and for that, women comedians uh, were never good looking or sexy or anything like that. You had to be really big or really, you know, you had, you had to be like Tony Fields or Joan Rivers before the facelift. You had to be, um, it was strange. It was a weird thing. They, they considered Stella. those women were funny, but if you looked sort of good, you were not, you could not be funny. So uh, he made a good point there. I had a hard time with the character of getting a film uh, based around it because they said, it was really like women aren't funny. I mean, can you believe that? Okay, I can't, because I think the funniest, uh, people I know, the funniest comedians in the world now are definitely women. So, there. So there. Uh, uh, sorry, guys. But that's just my taste, but, okay. Anyway, um, maybe we so, want to... Oh, you can go ahead. I was going to say, uh, the next clip? Sure, we could show you another clip from the movie. The, this is the making of documentary. Yeah, let's hear it. Uh, Sam Egan was uh, one of uh, a few writers on the movie. Of course, John Paragon was on there, too. Um, 
Talk about uh, exactly what all these different writers had to contribute, plus you also had a lot of contributions to this screenplay. There was uh, a lot of cooks. Oh yeah, no, there, were, there were three writers, um, John Paragon, Sam Egan, who you just saw, and myself, and uh, it was the most fun thing I ever did in my life, I swear. It was, uh, we had a blast. Um, John and I came up with the initial thing and pitched it to NBC, and then NBC uh, brought Sam in. I suggested Sam because he had been the writer on the Fall Guy episode that I was yeah. on, and he sort of got the character, and and got the whole vibe and he was into horror and so uh, Sam came on actually to babysit John and I. I know it was to babysit us because <laughs> we would come up with a lot of good ideas but we would never get them down on paper and never kind of make them into a script. So Sam like came in and, and made us sit down and be quiet. <laughs> and so we all wrote it together. It was awesome. We just had the best time just ripping on, you know, the ideas we had. And, and like, like they said, I kind of have a point A, uh, uh, you know, to point Z, knew what I wanted to kind of accomplish. But uh, anyway, they, they were awesome. And, and it was just amazing. We, uh, we had too much fun. I, I, I guess, I don't know if you guys are familiar also with John Paragon. Sam, by the way, wrote The Twilight Zone, the new twi newer Twilight Zone. He he's written a million and one television shows since then. And John Paragon was Johnny the Genie in Pee Wee's Playhouse. And then he, uh, he directed all of the Pee Wee Playhouse's episodes. And he used to, he's an amazing comedian, also from the Groundlings. So anyway, that was kind of how that came about, us three writing. And, it was it was uh, really 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 fun. <laughs> you mentioned the Groundlings. Uh, you you worked in a few of your Groundling members into the movie. I did. I wanted to hire all of the Groundling members, but there weren't parts for everybody, you know. So I had to um, try to get everyone in that I could. But there's a, the movie is populated by a lot of Groundlings. Of course, the main one being Edie McClurg. Uh, yeah, he's fantastic. I mean, we knew right away we were having Edie. We wrote that part around her. She is Chastity Mariah. <laughs> yeah, the girl, like, she's always kind of like, I'd come in the show and she'd go, are you going to be wearing that in the sketch? Yeah. And I, uh, yeah. So, you know, she's like, oh. so I was like, my mother, I hope you're going to wear a bra with that. <laughs> oh my God. Anyway, so we go, Perfect person for, for uh, Chastity Pariah, and I've got to say, she did the most amazing job ever. Yeah. Um, so, uh, maybe you want to show another clip? You bet. Let's, let's play like another that. clip, and then we'll talk some more. Take um, which uh, back lot was that that you... From um, that back lot ended up being... Um, well, it started out being Universal, and then it moved... We were shooting at Universal, and every few minutes, a tram would come through. I'm not kidding. And we'd all stop in the middle of what we were doing, and then we'd go, this is Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, being shot. There's Elvira, hi. And we, I, I can't believe it. I mean, you shoot there, and they don't stop the tourist trams from coming through and waving. So we left, and we went to Warner Brothers, where we shot the whole rest of it on the um, lot, except we ended up, um, we were not going to shoot the Vegas number. They ran out of money. And we, after much, much begging and pleading, um, ended up shooting it. We had to go back in and shoot that at Raleigh Studios in Hollywood. But yeah, so basically, basically mostly Warner Brothers, but a little bit here and there for different reasons. What kind of input did uh, New, New World Pictures and NBC have in uh, the production? Did they try to tone down Elvira at all, or were you allowed to? Uh, bust out any way you wanted in the film. Oh, bust out? No, I wasn't allowed to totally bust out. But, uh, yeah, uh, uh, we got quite a bit of pushback from NBC. Um, they, one of the things they insisted on was putting teenagers in the movie, which we didn't have in the original movie that we wrote. We had uh, less characters and a little more development in each character, but they insisted on teenagers. They said that nobody will go see a movie uh, if there's not teenagers in it. If, if no teenagers will go see the movie if there's no teenagers. And I was like, what, what about aliens? Uh, what about, you know, just <laughs> listing five million movies? Anyway, um, New World, thank God, had no uh, part in it. <laughs> except screwing up the distribution <laughs> later. Uh, so they didn't have any part, uh, but, but uh, NBC, 
we tried, tried our best. We were in the same, of the same mind as NBC to keep it PG-13. We did not want to slip into an R. And once you do that, you seriously limit your audience. And, you know, we wanted, I mean, it's kind of a movie for younger kids too. Not, not little ones maybe, but you know, 12 and up. And uh, so we really, really fought to keep it PG-13. There were some odd things that happened that would not be, that would push it into an R. There were ridiculous things. We had things that were so much steamier in it than some of the things that you couldn't do. But uh, yeah, as far as that, as far as censorship goes, NBC and, and us were all pretty much in, on the same thinking in that. Uh, the director of the film, James uh, Signorelli, tells, told me that he thinks the film would have been more successful if it had been an R, if you got to be the more raunchy um, Elvira. How do you feel about that? I feel completely that James is 100% wrong about that because I fought my whole life to keep Elvira kind of right on an edge where she doesn't go too far and become super raunchy. She stays, you know, a little risque, but never crosses that line. So I think if it would have gotten into an R, I, I would not have wanted that. I would have clawed that back myself, you know? So yeah, I just always felt that El El Elvira does appeal to children. And you know, I know it's kind of weird, but it, it, you know, it's. I try to keep Elvira from just using bad language and doing a few things that could be really not very child friendly. She has plenty that's not child friendly, but I don't think they're overt enough to for kids to kind of get it usually, unless they till till they get to be about twelve. Now maybe about five. I don't know. Yeah. So anyway, yeah. There you go. <laughs> you want to see another clip? Yeah, let's see another clip. A part of Vinny, Uncle Vinny, with Vincent Price in mind. And I really, really felt like Vincent was going to do it because we were very friendly and he really liked the character. And, um, you know, I don't know exactly the reason he didn't do it. I have a feeling it was his wife, Coral Brown. <laughs> <laughs> she was tough. She was tough. She kind of read, you know, what Vincent did and didn't do. But she was awesome. I, I loved her very much. Um, but, yeah. Vincent Price was who we wanted for that part, you know, and I desperately wanted him because I had grown up with him being my favorite star, and it would have just been a dream come true. And, uh, and we had some, I, I went, oh my God, I wish I would have, I should have brought it. I went through all my casting notes the other day. Um, we had some amazing people that we were trying to cast for things, but my favorite one was that um, on, on the top of my casting list for the teenagers um, was a guy. Uh, Brad Pitt. He had never acted before. He had never acted in a movie or anything. And I have my notes still on the casting uh, sheet. They say, yum, yum. <laughs> and uh, we finally decided we had Brad come back and back and back and back. <laughs> and we finally decided that Brad um, was not going to work because he was so damn hot that if he was in a movie, Elvira would forget about her boyfriend Bob and she would be all over Brad and Brad would be playing uh, under, you know, under 18 years old so that wouldn't have been good, you know. I'd end up, you know, the opposite Me Too movement. <laughs> so we thought, he's just too hot, I can't be around him. He's gotta go. And luckily I saved Brad's career. <laughs> he's very grateful to me. I've run into him since and he's, I said, I single-handedly saved your career, Brad. Had you been in that movie? Uh, the lead guy that played your part sort of never went anywhere. He's a great guy, Chris Cam, he's wonderful. But uh, you didn't turn into Brad Pitt, that's for damn sure. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, we'll show you guys another clip. Yeah, yeah this is... Um, anyway, so... Did... Sure. Um... Talk about uh, the, some of those young actors. I mean, that, this was a big break for them. They, they talk so lovingly about working with you on the film. How were they? How were these young, young performers? Oh. We had we had a blast. Of course, they were all a lot older than they were supposed to. You know, they were all in their twenties playing teenagers. But we had a blast. I gotta say, I probably hung out most with the teenagers because that's my level of you know. Whatever. <laughs> so we were we were just having a great time together, partying, and I just had so much fun. And they worked out really well. They were they were all great. Um, 
One of them is so funny, Ellen Dunning, the, the girl that was in the shot there that played the teenage girl. She's a vice cop now in LA. It's awesome, right? And she's gorgeous. She's just stunning. Um, Did she pull you over once? Is that yeah, how no, you knew that? <laughs> no, not for vice reasons, no. <laughs> Yes, I was hooking on Hollywood Boulevard now. <laughs> no, no. She didn't pull me over. She I ran into her. Um, uh, not my car, but... Uh, anyway, no, she was awesome. They were all great. And Ira, I love Ira, the guy that was just talking. I mean, he looks exactly the same, doesn't he? It's weird. It's like, and it was so funny. This is sad. He was telling me, I went to the premiere of your movie at the Roosevelt Hotel when I was on my 22nd birthday. And then he came to see me at Knott's. And he said, this is so weird. I was, I was there at my 22nd birthday for your premiere, and I'm here tonight, it's my birthday, I'm 55. Wow. <laughs> what? That's somebody that's playing a joke on me. <laughs> anyway, so, no, that was that. But they were, they were awesome. There was, there was nobody in the movie that was not awesome. Nobody that I uh, wouldn't, you know, love to work around and be with. They were all pros, and they all just did an amazing job. What about Gunk? Your dog. Gunk. Oh, well, I mean, I wouldn't work with him again, but one thing he's oh, dead. <laughs> he'd be the world's oldest dog. Yes. <laughs> There's Gunk. Please take a bow, Gunk. Yes. <laughs> Gunk was uh, this little dog named Benny, who had been in a million and one movies. Uh, boy, if you look that dog up on that, I think they had on the credits in here, they talk about him. He had been in so many movies, he was like a huge star, you know? But there were three gonks, there were the three gonks that actually worked on the show. Uh, they had different reasons, different things that they did, but Benny was the main one. And uh, Benny was a little bastard. He was, I mean, he was really the worst little dog. I love dogs, you have no idea how much I love dogs. And Benny only loved his trainer, period, nobody else. And he bit Kurt Fuller on the leg really bad. I mean, they had to get the paramedics in there and fix him up. He, um, every time I held him, he was like growling, like, I am gonna bite you next, second. And all the pictures you see of me and him, I, if you've ever seen any PR pictures of me with Gonk, I'm like sort of going like, <laughs> waiting for him to snap my nose off. Um, but anyway, he is, Highly trained, brilliant little dog, but he just didn't like anybody. So that was typical. But one of the funny things was when you're shooting a movie and you have a trained animal in it, which I learned uh, during my movie, is that you have you're shooting a scene and you've got the trainer like hiding behind a chair, like six feet away, and you're doing the scene with dialogue, and the whole time you're talking, the trainer is going, Benny, Benny, down, Benny, Benny, sit, Benny through your whole entire scene, every day, every minute, if the dog's in the scene. So you have to go back in and you have to um, dub all of your lines again when they take out the sound of the trainer screaming. So it was tough though, you're trying to think of your lines and someone's yelling, stop, stop, hey, no, you know, oh my God, that was tough. Don't ever work with dogs and kids, remember? They said, someone said that. And you like both. Huh? And you had both on this movie. I had both on this movie, and Those it was, it was kids, really though. tough. Yeah, the baby. The baby was three also, triplets. Yeah, because they can only, when they're that little, they can only work ten minutes. And uh, the makeup, I did not like the idea of having makeup on a, on a baby, but they did it anyway. <laughs> I didn't let them do the dye on the dog. I made them do vegetable dye, no hair dye. And boy, that caused that you can thank you. That said, no, you're gonna dye the dog. It's vegetable dye, so every morning it had to be redone because it just wore off through, through shooting. And oh, they hated me for that. There, there's a scene about that in your, in, uh, your documentary, but um, about how the director was sitting there every day waiting while they dyed the dog again. So they were all not that happy with me about that, but I was. Anyway, you want to play another clip? Play another clip. It was a, the gap. It's so funny. We uh, we went on to become really, really good friends after that. Uh, you know, quite an experience together. That you know, it's like going through a war together, sort of. And uh, we became really great friends. And she worked as my assistant um, for years and years after that. So, um, really good friend, and she, she was fantastic doing that. You, you see her in all the things where you see my hand, or you see my foot, um, 
And you know what, she was living, I gotta, this is so funny, she'd kill me if I told you this, but at the time she was living with this young comedian guy who she'd been with for like seven years, and she was, uh, you know, with this guy all the time, and we were always talking about him and complaining, but um, he was Jerry Seinfeld. Oh. Uh, <laughs> it was so funny. And then when he got his show, he dumped Susan. But anyway, let's not go there. Okay. Yeah, she'd been like sort of supporting him for like seven years, paying most of the bills. Oh, I love that story. <laughs> anyway, she is an absolutely great gal, but she did a fantastic job. Do you wish Susan could have done the scenes where you're tied to the stake in the film? God, I wish she could have done that. She did do a little bit of it, a little bit of it, but I did the main part because I had to be, you know, in the photo, and it was a full body photo. So she had to go through a little bit of that, and in the DVD, I don't think I have the clip here, but she explains about what a freaking nightmare the shoot was. It took three nights, it was in January, so it got down into like low, you know, I don't know, mid-30s or something. Um, Luckily, I had a giant bonfire fire around me, so I was very warm and toasty. But she had to put up with some of that too. And not only did we have fire and huge crowds to deal with of people, the townspeople, but we had um, rain. <laughs> so you got wet, you got burned, you got yeah, everything that could happen. And it was a night shoot. We'd been shooting in the daytime before that, so suddenly you're getting up every morning at 5 a.m. and then suddenly you're going to bed every day at 5 a.m. It was really discombobulating. And you're working with a lot of dangerous things. The fire was really very dangerous. I was scared out of my mind. I had to be covered head to toe in this flame retardant stuff that itched so bad. You, you can't believe it. And my hands were tied behind my back. And I couldn't scratch. And I was there for like hours and hours and begging people to come up and scratch the side of my face or my nose or whatever. <laughs> So it was, I know, it was melting, melting from those flames, which were very, very close by. So it was challenging. It was, I wouldn't want to do that again, really. I will get Susan for that next time. Didn't your wig also catch fire in one of the shots? No, God, no. My, he, he asked if my wig caught fire. No, that's what we prevented that from catching fire. Uh, my wig is super flammable. I mean, it's solid hairspray, so don't stand near any candles or anything, girls, there in your Elvira drag. Um, yeah, no, I thought it'd go up like a match, you know? But uh, no, I was so, it was completely soaked in, uh, in flame retardant stuff. So, we were good. Um, but okay, we got another clip for you guys. Is he? <laughs> yeah, he was the hardest guy to track down for the documentary. He was the, la I think the last person we interviewed. It was hard to yeah. find, but he gave us some good stuff. He's pretty much out of show business these days. I think he works in, uh, I think he lives in South Carolina or something. Right. Yeah, I love him, Daniel Green. He's just such a great guy. Um, but when we were casting Bob, our idea, Elvira would like, like because Elvira's a little bit of a, like a female chauvinist pig, she would like, like the male equivalent of a blonde bimbo with big boobs, you know? So we were looking for a guy that was like that, you know, like kind of big and muscly and like boo -boo. A himbo. <laughs> Yeah. A himbo. A himbo, exactly. That's exactly what we're looking for. And every time we would have someone come in uh, for casting, the, each guy that we saw, they would either be incredibly attractive, not as attractive as Brad Pitt, but they would be really attractive <laughs> and couldn't act their way out of a paper bag, or they would be not attractive enough and they would be a really good actor. And we. I think Bob was the hardest role to cast. We just kept seeing people more and more and more and more, and uh, took forever. And uh, I, we, honest, we saw that look on his face, and we go, "That's our man," you know, like a big dumb little Abner type, you know, hard to cast. It really was. Uh, but he knows that he wouldn't be mad at me calling him. <laughs> and he was so perfect. My favorite scene in the film was when he goes, uh, we're "In the flash dance thing," and they're dropping that stuff on me. And right before that, he goes. All right. I don't know. I thought that was such a brilliant one. <laughs> oh God. Anyway, <laughs> you want to play another clip? Sure. We got a ton. Oh, we met Jose Salak. We have Susan Kellerman, who played Patty, and uh, she was just great. She was perfect. Maybe, maybe you guys saw her in the uh, uh, what was she in Beetlejuice? She was in that. She was awesome. Which is also having its 30th anniversary, right? Yeah, we're gonna do a Beetlejuice panel right after this one. Yeah, which is a trip because you know he's trying to get uh, 
uh, steal their director to, for my movie, and I didn't end up with, with them. You know, that was a bummer. Uh, he did Pee Wee's movie and then Beetlejuice, and no time in between, so that would have been nice. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, Patty was awesome, but she did have big boobs, and that was a problem, because we needed somebody really flat-chested. So this poor woman had to work with just like these giant ace bandages squishing her boobs down for the whole movie, which was not that comfortable for her, but she put up with it, and she did a great job. I didn't have to worry about that. <laughs> Let's take a question or two from the audience. Yeah, right here. What inspired the wig? Um, my friend Bob Redding, who is a real name is Robert Redding, who was came up with the look of Elvira. He was a friend of my dear, dear friend who was an artist. His favorite band was the Ronettes, and his favorite singer in the world was Ronnie Spector. And he said, you are doing Ronnie Spector hair. And he said like that too. You are doing Ronnie Spector hair. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And uh, so really, go online, Google Ronnie Spector. Her hair is so freaking gigantic. Uh, and I adore her too, but that's where the hairdo came from, the 1960s girls group, the Ronettes. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, question over here. Go ahead, yeah. Your favorite band story. Band story. Oh, my favorite Fans, band story. Band story. Oh, good lord, my favorite band story. I don't know, I have a million of them. I, uh, God, just pulling one out of my, you know. I don't, one time, I, one time I was in line signing autographs in New York, and I'm signing, and this guy was uh, really rushing. I was signing my DVD, uh, which had just come out, and I'm like signing Joey, and uh, and I looked up, and it's the Ramones. Were, yeah, all of them. And they were in my line just getting the autograph, and I'm like, oh, holy crap! You're the Ramones! Switch seats with me! <laughs> God, so that was awesome. I mean, that's a good fan story, right? I, I mean, I guess, I, you know, I love my fans. I mean, I, I, uh, they, I have the loyalest, best fans ever. I'm clapping for you guys. I really, I really do. And I, that's no joke. I mean, my fans are fantastic. And I, people always go, oh, do people, you know, say rude things to you or try to grab your boobs or whatever? I go, never, never. My fans are just so well-behaved. <laughs> When I'm around anyway. But yeah, no, I have some great fans. And so I thank you guys for always coming to all these events and you know, you know, my friends. And... Oh, uh, take this question and then we'll show another clip. My first question is How about later at my table? Would that be good? Thank you. I accept all gifts, credit cards, and money orders. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's show another clip then. We had just met like 10 minutes before, and the next thing, you know, he's laying on top of me, my legs are up in the air. Oh my God. How many takes? Huh? How many takes did you do with that scene? Uh, I think we only likely did like one a take of that, believe it or not. But he was so embarrassed, he was so shy, it was really funny. I was sort of like, yeah, whatever. Uh, I'm used to everything, you know? <laughs> but uh, he was adorable to work with, and, and uh, really, really shy about doing that scene. Uh, but I, I, have you guys seen him in other films? Because he's oh, yeah. gone on to be huge. No holds barred. Yeah, he's amazing. Um, anyway, yeah, so Harold Glotter. Uh, right, do we have another question? Yeah, the, on the aisle here. Yeah, go ahead, stand up. Are any deleted scenes from Mistress of the Dark that we will see someday? Oh my gosh, I don't know. I, I don't know where those are. That um, They were kept by NBC, I'm imagining. I do have a ton of footage that my ex-husband shot uh, on little tiny video cassettes that were backstage of, of the movie. And there are some amazing scenes there. I, I unfortunately, I've been trying to like uh, get the rights to be able to show those, and I'm no, I can't get them. So, and they also include a lot of other people in them, and you have to have those people okay you showing them anywhere too. So, it's just my little box of video that I sit at home and have fun with and by myself. <laughs> I mean, I know there was tons of great stuff, but where they went, who knows? 
Bummer, huh? Okay, I think we have time for one more clip. Uh, we'll show you that. Before you go, we have a couple of special guests in the audience. Um, uh, your director from the sequel to this film, <laughs> Elvira's Haunted Hills, is here, Sam Irvin. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Where was it? Oh, come out. Yeah, have you guys seen Haunted Hills? Yeah. Sam directed it graphically. Yeah, and we also an amazing have job on that film. And we're both giant. Tell, tell, just tell one quick story about how I knew you were the right person when I met you. Here, just for all this. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> yes, um, Cassandra, I, I met her at a party. It was actually Terry Sweeney's party. And uh, she, had, uh, she said that she had just seen my film Guilty as Charged. And Rod Stagger, yeah. right? Oh, my God. And Mitch Pledgy, who's here, is also in it. Yeah. yeah. So um, anyway, she told me that she really loved my film, and if she ever did another Elvira movie, she wanted to do, uh, she wanted me to direct it. And I'm like, yeah, Hollywood speak, I believe that. So a few years later, <laughs> she actually called me up and said, uh, come on over and have a meeting with us, because we're, we're talking to different directors about doing Elvira's Haunted Tales. And so I went over, and she handed me a script, and she said, now, this is a spoof of the Roger Corman, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, Vincent Price movies, and I don't know if you know anything about them, and I'm like, honey? <laughs> Pit, Pit and the Pendulum is one of my favorite films of all time. And, and so I went into Vincent Price's monologue at the end of the film, and I said, do you know where you are, Bartolome? You are about to enter hell. Hell, the Neverworld, the Infernal Region, the Abode of the Damned, the Place of Torment, Gehenna, Naraka, the Pit, and the Pendulum, the Razor Edge of Destiny, thus the condition of man bound on an island from which he can never hope to escape, surrounded by the waiting Pit of Hell, okay. which Yay. must destroy him finally. Yay. And then she said, you're hired. <laughs> I did. Anybody that just pulled that out of the air and just uh, recited that was like, what? I was so impressed. Anyway, Sam was amazing, and he got Haunted Hills together. He got Richard O'Brien, more or less, to talk into playing that, that role. And uh, it was... Which, which was the Vincent Price role. Yeah, it was, again, Vincent Price that we wanted. But, uh, yeah, we keep trying to do things with Vincent. It just uh, doesn't work out, right? But uh, anyway. Yeah, we have another special guest here. He's a former editor of USA Today. His name is Dave Colton, and he'd like to make a special announcement. Oh, sweet. somebody from New York to say Cassandra. But, uh, um, I'm the administrator of the Rondo Hatton Classic Horror Awards. I don't know how many of you voted this year? Yeah. Sam uh, won. Um, and Cassandra has been inducted into the Monster Kid Hall of Fame. Yep. For all the silliness of Elvira and the character, I don't think she gets enough credit for, in, when she began in the late 80s, there were no conventions like this, and there weren't horror channels, and you know, you couldn't go online and check things out. And for all the fun she made of the films, she also winked, this, this is good stuff, this stuff is worthy, and she kept the monster movies alive as much as famous monsters or Fangoria or any of the things that we read every day. And she should be thanked for that.
Elvira.com, all new website coming in a week. So uh, check it out, all new. And, and be sure Thank to say hi to her. So She's right outside uh, the dealer's room, yeah. right outside the theater, signing all, uh, all day tomorrow. You'll be back tomorrow? I'm not back oh, tomorrow. Okay. So Today's just your today and this end of the day. Thank you, guys. Let's hear it again for Sandra Peterson. I'm also saying.